Well, Melbourne is understandably nervous with five more cases of COVID-19. The not-so-distant memory of a mandatory lockdown hangs ever too close. And with Sydney recording another 10 cases, as I said, we seem to be facing a new COVID nightmare just as we head into the new year. So why, with one week to go, would holding the cricket at the SCG with 22,000 strong crowd be a good idea, but the New South Wales government consider it too dangerous to allow essential workers to attend the New Year's Eve fireworks, even if seated, ticketed and masked? Doesn't make sense to me. I was joined a little earlier by leading epidemiologist Professor Mary Louise McLaws and asked her these inconsistencies, or about these inconsistencies, in the lead up to New Year's Eve and beyond. Certainly, if they use some sort of testing system that did a rapid test that took 15 minutes of everybody going into the SCG to get an idea of whether or not they're going in positive or negative and send the positives away back home, uh, that would make some sense. Uh, but having the frontline essential workers not being able to enjoy uh, the fireworks, particularly when people who have an expensive restaurant reservation can enjoy the fireworks, it seems to me non-inclusive. And Australians are not hierarchical. They are very inclusive. And that's what Fireworks was all about, going to the foreshore and enjoying it. And if, if our essential workers can't go, who, could, who should go? We should postpone it. And so everybody can go, but particularly our much-loved essential workers. I stress again, Mary Louise, I'm no medical expert here, but, uh, you know, I look at some of the inconsistencies in the decisions that have been made right around Australia. I mean, obviously the world as well, but looking at Australia. And I, I think it leads to confusion among the general public. On the one hand, you can have thousands and thousands of sporting events. On the other hand, you can't really go to church, or if you do, even behind a mask, you can't sing, even if there's only 30 in the congregation. There are limited numbers on people that go to Christmas gatherings, and yet, you know, broth and all sorts of establishments like that remain open in apparently a COVID-safe way. Uh, people are trying to work out where the logic, the golden thread of logic is in all of these decisions. Am I the only one who's a little confused? No, I think that most outbreak epidemiologists are confused. It would appear that anything to do with the business sector will go ahead, um, albeit supposedly safe, and anything that doesn't um, may not go ahead. Outbreak management is completely um, separate from uh, the idea of uh, business and also uh, pleasure. And we just look at what will make it worse. And, you know, this isn't a very nice disease, and you want everybody to get through this without having had COVID. And we know that there's a large proportion of people who will get through it but still have that long-term effect like um, uh, severe um, uh, fatigue and uh, uh, breathing problems. Mm. Why would you want anybody to have that? So I'm confused as well. I'm confused that we're not making masks mandatory. We know that the, it is safe scientific, it protects you and it protects everybody else from you in case you're incubating it and you're in that pre-symptomatic phase and it protects everybody from your exhalation. Uh, we do know mass gatherings are difficult to control because you've got to get through the turnstile, through uh, public transport and sit there and then potentially shout and enjoy yourself through the mask and that will stop the mask from working. So there needs to be across the board logic. And we asked our Muslim community to refrain from enjoying Eid, and yet we had the three days over Christmas where people could be at home. And we know from the experience of China that household um, outbreaks occur very um, commonly if somebody comes to your home or is in your home in indoor settings. Right. So I'm not sure why we're allowed to have extra people, particularly when we're on a knife edge. And, and now, of course, we're, we're up to 159 cases. Um, so there needs to be much more 
without break management, without that um, uh, pressure from business and pressure from uh, keeping uh, people happy. The thing that will keep people happy is getting rid of this uh, threat of uh, the virus back to where we were before, before it slipped out of the um, travelers or potentially the quarantine hotel. All right, well, let me just ask you about that then. I mean, I, I understand your point of view, but there again, you see a, a prime minister or a premier has to make a decision based not just off health advice from health officials, but they're also getting advice, you would think, from uh, economic advisers and business advisers. There are a lot of different slices to this pie, and they've got to try to balance it as best as they can, not to send the place broke, not to send people's mental health through the roof and the rest of it. It's not, it's not an easy decision to be made. Um, so, uh, obviously, there's got to be an element of nuance in any response, doesn't there? It can't just be shut down and hope to eliminate. Absolutely correct. And the earlier that you act, the less impact it has on people's mental state and the economy, because when you go in hard and early, you can get out very rapidly. So South Australia had a problem. They shut down for three days. They worked out what their problem was. They opened up. Um, now, in Victoria, uh, they didn't mandate masks until the 2nd of August. By that stage, they had over 5,000 cases, but just 41 days before that, they had the same number of cases or thereabouts over a 14-day period as New South Wales is now suffering. So it can get out of hand very rapidly, and that's why you go in fast, so you do not have to have lockdown for a long period of time. So you don't have to cancel the cricket or you know, the, the soccer or whatever it happens to be. So you get in early, so you can get out very early. But now we've now got 159 cases. Um, it's going to be a very difficult decision to lock down because um, it may be, if they don't do it now, it'll probably be too late and then we'll have to do it for a really extended period of time. Yeah. And it's all very well and good to have fabulous, a world-class contact tracers. But the best contact tracer is the one that gets to stay at home and we get to not spread it. So um, really contact tracing happens after the fact. We need to prevent infection. Prevention always better than cure in the medical world. I, I get your point. Just before you go, let me ask you this one last one, and that is, let's assume we, quote unquote, eliminate the virus as far as the official numbers are concerned in Australia. We then, of course, will have increasingly open borders. We'll be bringing Australians back home. Some will, well, most should go to hotel quarantine. But eventually, a case will leak out. Uh, short of the world being completely vaccinated, and that's a long, long, long way off, uh, there is always going to be the risk or the threat, isn't there, of the virus resurfacing, no matter how hard and quickly we lock down now? Oh. Absolutely, Michael. Um, the issue is that um, quarantine can be improved. Uh, people can be tested before they get on the plane with the rapid point of care test. Uh, it's not a diagnostic test, but it's particularly good at identifying if you're carrying it in the first five days or even up to 10 days. It's actually even more accurate than the current test we used for diagnosis. So you can test before you get on the plane. If you're positive, you might have to stay where you were for a bit longer. Then when you arrive, if you're one of the lucky that gets to be an exempted person, from quarantine hotel, you get tested, and then you get maybe a take-home test. We, we, an Australian company has made them. We yeah. need to be um, more innovative and more using technology so that people don't have to stay in quarantine for 14 days. We might be able to get them out sooner. Sure. So, yes, we have to learn to live with the risk, and that risk needs to be low, and we need to shore up these um, the, the, our greatest risk, and that is from return travellers mm. and mm. flight crew.